What's happening, Boot Junkies? Mike Delgadio here, back with another video on home studio setup for voiceover. Today, we're taking a look at this microphone here. This is the Austrian Audio OD505 Active Dynamic Microphone. I'm going to go over the ins and outs of this mic, and at the end, compare it to a number of other mics so you can get a sense of how this mic performs to see if it's right for you. The good folks over at Austrian Audio were kind enough to send me this mic so that I could share it with you. They're letting me keep the microphone, but I'm not otherwise compensated for this review. They will have no editorial input, and they will not see this video before you do. If you've watched any of my other videos recently, you'll know that I typically don't pass judgment. I just want you to see and hear the mic to show you how it works and to let you see if it's right for you. Right? Okay, let's get started. This is a super cardioid pattern, handheld, dynamic microphone that they say is appropriate for both stage and studio. It'll run you about $300 at the time I'm making this video. Now, right off the bat, the look of this microphone is quite unusual. There's this gap or a void behind the main basket. And this is unlike any of my other dynamic microphones. Austrian Audio says that there is a second passive capsule back there hiding out and that that capsule is polarity rotated. In this instance, I'm not sure exactly what rotated means. I'm not sure if it means rotated 180 degrees to cancel phase or if it refers to phase rotation itself and is somewhere in between. I don't know. I usually think of phase as being rotated, not polarity. I think of polarity as being flipped, which I guess is mostly rotated by 180 degrees, but it's subtly different. Anyway, I can't find a deeper explanation for what this means in this particular case, so I can't elaborate further on the technical specifics of it. But I can say that the, ultimately the design is to reduce handling noise by canceling it out somehow. So let's put that to the test. I'll just pull the microphone out of the clip here and use it handheld and move the microphone from one hand to the other and, and adjust my finger position. And I, I know I can hear some noise coming through. So the capsule alone, this capsule alone, it doesn't provide like perfect cancellation of handling noise. Okay, one sec while I put this microphone back in the clip. As you get closer to the microphone, the frequency response graph shows that there is a significant boost in the mid-bass region due to proximity effect. But as you get close to it, as if you were using it on stage like this, there is a full 10 decibel boost at around 120 hertz. And I think you can hear that pretty clearly, right? There's a lot of proximity effect. And you can see on the dashed line on the response graph that as you get to within 2 inches or about five centimeters of the capsule, 120 hertz frequency does go way up. It's not clear from the frequency response diagram um, what happens when the high pass uh, response, when the high pass filter is engaged. We expect it to be less, but they don't say how much less, but we'll just have to judge it by ear. So on the back of the microphone, there is a little switch to engage the high pass filter. So there's a little switch on the bottom, which is a high-pass filter. The high-pass filter is designed to reduce the response from 120 hertz and down. If you're unfamiliar with that term, high-pass, it just means that all frequencies higher than or above a certain frequency are allowed to pass. High-pass. And frequencies below a certain point are progressively reduced until a certain point. Until a certain, at a certain point, the sound is simply blocked. Okay. So the high pass filter is intended to eliminate plosives and some of the handling noise. So we'll take it out. I still hear handling noise when I do this. Um, and they describe the high pass filter as second order, which if I understand it correctly means that they are using two different high passes in some way to create a specific curve. However, the documentation doesn't give any specifics or rate of roll off. Sometimes a mic spec sheet will say that it's three decibels per octave or six decibels per octave in reduction, but I can't find it spelled out anywhere. The response, uh, the frequency response diagram indicates that it is a fairly steep high pass filter, but it's also highly dependent on the distance from the capsule, which you would expect. Okay, bear with me for one second and I'll turn the high pass filter back in the off setting. Okay, okay. 
Now, while we're talking about the frequency response graph, we can see that there is also a significant presence boost from about 3,500 hertz and up, starting to taper off again around 5,000 hertz, with the boost completely gone by 10,000 hertz. And this is somewhat lower in the frequency spectrum than with other microphones. I'm thinking about other microphones like the, the Shure Beta 87A, which is another microphone that you may be considering at this price point. Its presence boost starts around around 2K, but it doesn't peak until about 9 kilohertz. Pretty different. We'll compare this mic to the Beta 87A a little bit later along with some other mics, so you'll be able to see how they compare, see which is, might be better for you. But even a mic like the Shure SM58 shows a broader presence boost. So in particular, we want to listen for any high-end clarity or darkness in this microphone. Now, it's just a thought, but it could be that this microphone is more well-suited to people with a sharp S or a whistling S because this microphone will be darker in those regions. So normally you'd have a de or you'd equalize out those frequencies, which is kind of what this microphone's doing for you already. So it may be better if you've got a sharp S sound. Now, thinking about the polar pattern of this microphone, it has a super cardioid pattern, which will be somewhat more forgiving of less than perfect acoustic treatment in your room. A super cardioid pattern simply means that it's less sensitive to sound that comes from the side. So as I come to the side, by design, it won't hear sounds that come from the side as clearly from the front. So a place where this could be beneficial in a voiceover or podcasting world is let's say you've got multiple people on microphone at the same time. I'm thinking of a situation like a podcast that is also shot on video for something like YouTube. A pattern like this would allow two hosts to sit on the same side of a table and through a little bit of, you know, just adjusting the mic angle, you'd be able to put each host in the mic's less sensitive area, which would prevent bleed between the mics, which would make edit editing a lot easier, and both hosts could face the same camera a little bit easier. So it's something to think about. The basket or, or the grill here is removable, and underneath you'll find another aspect to this mic that Austrian Audio is highlighting specifically. They've created what they call a 3D pop noise diffuser. We can see that there's a pointed dome over the capsule with these plastic struts. This design, I imagine, is to, is to break up the blast of air that comes from plosive consonants like P's and B's. So let's see. Booth Junkie bought Bandrew a pepperoni and pineapple pizza. Please bring pizza pronto. Mmm, pizza. <laughs> Now, unlike passive dynamic microphones, the OD505 takes phantom power to operate. So there'll be a switch on your interface or your preamplifier. It may be labeled as 48V or plus 48. And unlike passive dynamic microphones, you'll need to switch that phantom power on for this mic to make any sound, even though it's a dynamic. Now, the documentation isn't explicit about what the active circuitry does, but it does call out some benefits that are designed to keep the sound consistent. In this case, it appears to eliminate variations in sound based on the impedance of the preamplifier. See, there's this tendency of the preamplifier impedance that can alter the overall tonality of a microphone, where a lower impedance, impedance can make a microphone darker and a higher impedance can make a microphone brighter. In fact, um, if you're familiar with the Cloudlifter Z, which is it, it, that's a device specifically to vary the impedance to explore different tonalities of passive microphones. But with the active circuitry, Austrian seems to be indicating that the variability has been factored out so that you can have a consistent sound no matter kind of what preamplifier you're plugging into, at least resistance impedance-wise or length of a cable that may affect the resistance and the sound of the, of the, uh, of the microphone. Um, but the preamplifier, the circuitry of the plate preamplifier itself may add its own coloration to the microphone. This is really talking about impedance and resistance that's factoring into the sound. Now, further, they're indicating that the microphone is more sensitive than passive dynamic microphones. And all the sensitivity means is that the amount of sound pressure needed to move the diaphragm is less on this microphone than on a passive dynamic microphone. It can hear quieter sounds, more detailed sounds. Uh, this means that this microphone will be more sensitive to very quiet sounds. But on the other hand, it could mean that it's also more likely to clip with extremely loud sounds. 
Austrian claims that the circuitry helps boost the sensitivity closer to the range of the condenser microphone, so it will behave more like a condenser. Now, it's not clear if this circuitry is also designed to add additional gain to the output as if there were a cloud lifter or a fed head installed, or if those terms are new for you, a cloud lifter or a fed head, or in general, a mic activator can boost the output of a dynamic microphone. Now, even if that active circuitry, even if that's not the case, a mic activator would not work with this microphone as all those devices block phantom power from reaching the microphone. If you feel you did want to have a mic activator to boost the gain, the one device that comes to mind immediately for me is the FedHead Phantom, which does boost gain and pass phantom power onto the microphone. If that's of interest to you, I'll have a link in the description down to the, the FedHead Phantom. Now, looking one more time at the basket, I have noticed that uh, wind or breath noise can be quite prevalent, especially in the way that I pronounce certain sounds like the F sound. It does seem to create a, a fair bit of wind when I'm up close to the microphone. Five fuzzy friends finagled French fries. Five fuzzy friends finagled French fries. The mic does not come with a clown nose or, or a foam filter that you often see on handheld microphones. And with the you know, somewhat unusual shape of the grill and, and the void in the back, I'm not sure how an external form foam filter would affect the performance of the microphone. I don't see a foam filter specifically for the OD505 for sale on the Austrian audio website. It does not come with one. But with a little cajoling, you can like fit a, uh, the foam filter that comes for uh, like a short SM58 on there. So it m might be worth a try if you get the mic and find it. The wind or breath sound is a, is a problem. Now, finally, as far as build quality goes, this mic seems super durable. High quality switch. Built like, a, built like a tank would be the vernacular that comes to mind. It's got an all-metal body, the arms that support the capsule, really rigid and durable. The grill is quite durable, not prone to flexing at all. I have no qualms, no issues at all about the build quality. It's right up there with lots of other, the, the really high-quality microphones, the Austrian Audio OC18 condenser microphone that I have, very high quality. Given the frequency response graph, and, and I think the tuning of this microphone, I think it does lend a very distinct character to it. And now you've had a really good chance to hear the microphone in action on its own, but I think it helps to compare it to other microphones so you can kind of see where it fits. I've got a whole mess of microphones over here. So we can just compare and do side-by-sides to see how we, how we think this microphone performs. And I think it gives you a, a good context to the microphone and it helps make a decision to see, if, to see if it's right for you. So I'm going to switch in a bunch of different microphones. Okay, first, we'll start very basic with a handheld dynamic microphone from Movo. This is the HVM5. This is a very affordable cardioid condenser microphone It'll run you about $75. And the Movo line of microphones, they're very affordable, but they often punch above their weight sound and build-wise. But I thought that this would be a good sort of entry point to begin showing how the OD505 sort of fits into the spectrum of microphones. I wanted to show how the, the sound of this microphone would stack up against a more uh, entry-level microphone. This is sort of a, a designed sound, if you would. And just because this is inexpensive, I, I don't want you to think that, uh, that it's a bad microphone or anything like that. There's, there's nothing wrong with the, uh, with the Movo microphones. They just happen to be less expensive. But the, the lower price in this case does not necessarily mean lower quality. And that goes for a number of the other microphones. And I think that this is a perfect case in point. Inexpensive does not mean bad quality. This is a Shure SM58 mic, and for just $25 more than the Movo, now we're using a mic that's seen on stages around the world. This uh, SM58 venerable workhorse mic for the stage. Super durable, and it has a typical dynamic microphone sound, the classic dynamic microphone sound, which should be maybe a bit dark, certainly darker than a condenser microphone, and we can see how it compares to the OD505. Is it as clear? Is it as nuanced? Does it sound different? You've heard this microphone a million times. And so now you've had a chance to see how the, the more expensive OD505 compares to the SM58. Okay, now here we have the Shure Beta 87A. The Beta 87A, this is the first microphone that I thought of as the, national, uh, the natural comparison point for the OD505. The Beta 87A is a handheld, 
super cardioid microphone and is a similar price point. The Beta 87A will run you about $250 compared to $300 for the OD505, but the Beta 87A is a condenser microphone. So like the OD505, this microphone requires phantom power, but it does have a different frequency response. So we should notice a difference in sound between the two. And you can judge to see if you prefer the tone of one mic over the other. But these were the two microphones that I thought were a very natural comparison. If you were trying to make a choice between the two, these seemed like a, a very natural uh, choice where the, both of these might be on your radar. So I wanted to make sure you had a chance to hear how they both sound. Okay, now this, this is the Shure KSM-8, one of Shure's premium stage dynamic microphones as opposed to the SM-58. This one's a lot more premium. This is, again, a cardioid pattern like the SM-58, but costs more than the OD-505. And this mic uh, came to mind for comparing to the OD-505 as this microphone has two diaphragms and specific features that are designed to reject handling noise. And uh, it's, got the, it's got two diaphragms that are supposed to help reduce handling noise and uh, any, without any loss of low frequency response. So it makes similar claims to the OD505, but at nearly $100 more. And as you listen, you can decide if one sounds better than the other to your ears. This KSM will set you back around $400. Okay, moving on. Now I thought we'd compare the OD505 to my, what might be my favorite dynamic mic for my voice. This is the Electro Voice RE20. If you're looking for dynamic mics for your podcast or for YouTube video work, the RE20 might be on your radar. So I wanted to let you see how these compare. At $450, the RE20 is quite a bit more expensive than the OD505. And this is a cardioid pattern, so it won't be as forgiving to sort of less than perfect uh, acoustic treatment. But th there is one similarity that they both have the, uh, the, the high pass filters, low cuts uh, to help attenuate some of that bass sound to help work, uh, uh, to help manage some of those plosives. And now hopefully I've vamped enough so that you have a good chance to hear how the RE20 compares to the OD505. Now I thought I would bring out something that's a little bit different here. This is the Lawton Audio LS208. It is an end address microphone and it's a condenser microphone like some of the other condensers that we've seen. So like the Austrian Audio, it does require phantom power. This mic will run you about $600. And I think you might be able to find a holiday deal if you're watching this at the same time the video is released. Again, links in the description. I chose this mic because it makes similar claims about being good in the studio and, if, and in live applications. It's not really designed to be handheld, though. It's really meant for being in a, in a, in a stand. But the Lawton Audio has multiple high pass and high, uh, high pass and low pass filters that uh, Lawton says will make this uh, mic work very well and sound good even in less than ideal acoustic environments. So live or in a podcasting situation, but you, it's considerably more expensive. This one will run you, I think I said six, $600. But I thought, uh, I just thought it would be interesting to see how these two compare. So a real expensive condenser microphone going up against an active dynamic so you get a chance, to, a chance to see how the two compare. I thought it would be interesting. Okay, staying up in the rarefied air at about $600, this is the Earthworks SR20. And let's see how it compares to the OD505. This is a small diaphragm condenser microphone that can be used both, of course, in the studio or handheld. You can tell by its design. But it's a condenser, so it does require phantom power, and it can be used in a handheld manner. Earthworks is known for creating extremely detailed, high fidelity, extremely high fidelity to the source. So I thought it would be an interesting point of comparison. This frequency response is extremely flat. There is no presence boost on the SR20. So it might be good for different voices compared to the OD505 or where faithfulness to the original source is important. But you can see how one might color the sound, how the OD505 might color the sound compared to the extremely flat uh, SR20. This one has a removable grill. And with the frequency response graph on the SR20, they say it becomes even flatter. The, the, this uh, grill does take a little tiny bit of the high frequency response away. So if you want the flattest response, almost turning this almost into a super high fidelity measurement microphone, 
the uh, the SR20 with its with its grill off but ooh, sorry it's super easy to put plosives into it uh, thus I think this is really needed but with the right mic mic technique this can be an extremely flat extremely high fidelity microphone and will cost you about six six hundred bucks but I wanted you to have an example just so you could hear how what I think is a, a somewhat colored mic or a tuned mic or a mic with a personality compares to a flat microphone just to give you a point of comparison. Sorry for the oh, sorry for the plosives. It's so easy to put plosives into this mic. Sorry, sorry about that. And finally, now you're hearing the Earthworks SR314. Absolutely beautiful, gorgeous mic, but it can be used handheld or in a stand. This is also a condenser microphone, so like the OD505, it requires phantom power. The SR314 will run you about $700 at the time I'm making this video, so you can see how these two stack up. So we've compared uh, a, a microphone that is considerably less expensive than the OD505 to see how the OD5 compares, but we'll also see if this compares up to a microphone that is considerably more expensive. So just trying to give you the, the full range couple of things about the SR314 uh, is, one, it's extremely high fidelity, and it's a cardioid pattern, but one of the things that it claims is no matter kind of where you are in the cardioid pattern, the tonality of the microphone doesn't change, so you really have a, a great deal of freedom. You want to have two people singing into a microphone, the cardioid pattern and something like the SR314 would be really appropriate, whereas the OD505 is more forgiving of that off-axis rejection. So super different performance characteristics for two different two different purposes. So the 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 super cardioid for when you want to have a less than ideal environment, talking right into it, so it's, it focuses just on you. Whereas the 314 being a cardioid that's that performs really the same from all, kind of all angles in front of the microphone. You just have different performance characteristics, and, and that can affect your choice of the microphone. Now you've got the SR314. And so there you have it. That is the Austrian Audio OD505. I want to say thank you to the folks over at Austrian Audio for sending me the microphone and these these headphones, which I have a re review coming up on these headphones um, Probably, probably my next video, I think. Um, but they sent both of these for review, so I wanted to share them with you and see if it helps you make a decision. But that's all I have for you today. And I hope it helps. I hope it helps you decide if the OD505 is, is the right microphone for you. That's my only goal, is to help you help you make that decision, make an educated decision. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I hope that helps. Now, go get yourself a microphone. Maybe one with the weird little void in the back. Maybe this is the microphone for you. That's for you to decide. But get yourself a microphone, any microphone, so you can get out there, get in a booth, and you can record something amazing. Thanks. We'll talk to you next time. Take care.